So good evening, everybody. Um, we're starting right at four o'clock. I'm going to ask uh, Jenna Rodriguez, the executive assistant to the board and superintendent, um, to just do the initial techni uh, technical introduction to how this meeting will function for everyone and for the public to know. And uh, also, uh, Ms. Rodriguez, if you can explain about public comments as well, that'd be helpful. You're on mute. Okay, great. So hello, everyone. Um, we have a couple of things we want to uh, share about technology. That being that you might be appearing with your computer and your cell phone um, for audio reasons um, or even for interpretation reasons. And so if you happen to be using two devices, please mute one, uh, preferably the computer. And that way we won't have a feedback loop. Uh, second to that is if you need to hear this meeting in Spanish, we are going to turn on the Zoom translation line, but only if you're using the Zoom app can you take advantage of that feature. So if you've clicked into a browser to get into this meeting, um, it will not function for you. And if you're calling in, it will not function for you. So I'm going to show on the screen and read out loud the phone number you would need to dial to hear this meeting conducted in Spanish. That area code on screen is 209-425-3127. And the pin is 915-441-954. If I can ask Ms. Casada to translate what I just said, and then we'll move on to um, the public speaking piece. Senora Casada. Jenna, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. En unos momentos estaremos activando el canal de audio para Zoom, pero solamente se puede escuchar siempre y cuando tiene eh, la aplicación descargada. También tenemos otra línea de Google Meet, por si falla la traducción. El número es 209-425-3127. El Código, eh, la clave, más bien la contraseña es 915-441-954. Thank you. And so all of our panelists will need to switch their audios to English, please. So if you look at your toolbar. And then a special note about public comments. So the sec there is public comment sections to address the multiple agencies here on this meeting today, but it is only for agenda items. So there are no general uh, comments to be made purely on what you see on the agenda. Uh, there'll be about a three minute speaking time uh, and the chair of the meeting will call for it at that time. Please be brief. Um, and I believe that's it, Dr. Wayne, if I'm not forgetting anything. No, thank you. And then before we go to uh, roll call, can uh, we have a few of participants who are on as attendees. Um, our two members from HARD, Paul Hodges and Director Hatcher. Uh, can you, are you able to promote them? Yes, I then, see uh, Mr. Hodges. Yeah, and then Elisa, uh, Elisa Marquez and um, Ken Rowden. Well, thank you both. I like to welcome everyone uh, this evening. Uh, we appreciate your time and we value your input. Uh, I am Dr. Annette Walker, board president, Hayward Unified School District. And if I may, I'd like to call to order the Hayward Local Agencies Committee, HLAC, meeting to order for uh, on Thursday, July 30th, 2020. And if we could have roll call, please. Okay, great. Uh, uh, so from Hayward Unified School District, Superintendent Dr. Wayne. Present. Thank you. Uh, board trustee, Mr. Rowden. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, board president, Dr. Walker. Thank you, present. Thank you. And then who do we have here from City Hall? Mayor Holiday. Yes, here. Thank you. Councilwoman Sarah Lamlin. Here. Councilwoman Elisa Marquez. Present. Thank you. Uh, and okay. our city manager. But, oh, excuse me? 
our city manager, Kelly McAdoo. There she is. There she is. I beg your pardon. Ms. McAdoo, city manager. Thank you. And then from hard, Mr. Uh, James Wheeler. See you. Uh, Mr. Hodges. Here. Thank you. Director Hatcher. I'm here. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Miss Jacqueline Diaz. I'm here. Thank you. <coughs> uh, Chris Peterson. Present. Thank you. Megan Tiernan. I do see her on screen. And then I see another person. I beg your pardon. I don't have a name for you. And um, there we go. Miss Janelle Cameron. Hello. Great. Thank you. And I think we do have um, a special attendee, uh, staff member, Alan Gard. Fantastic. Ask her. So if everyone will do this, we Everyone will mute their lines, and then as people speak, you can unmute, and that way we can help manage the background. Uh, I'll turn it back over to you, Dr. Walker. Thank you, Ms. Rodriguez. We, again, we want to welcome everyone. We appreciate your involvement in HLAC this evening. It's good to see everyone. Um, so generally, we like to start with the Pledge of Allegiance as well, and I know, I believe at our last meeting, our superintendent was able to have a, a flag uh, as his background. So I'm not sure if we're able to pull that off tonight. <laughs> yeah, all right, here we go. Dr. Ram, would you like to lead us in the pledge? Sure. Hey, hey, hey. Stand. Okay, with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America, America. America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well done. Thank you, Superintendent Wayne. So we're going to move just right along here. Um, we're looking at our second agenda item, which is the COVID-19 response. And I'm looking forward to hearing um, our reports out along these lines this evening. So Dr. Wayne, let me let you go ahead and uh, frame that for us. Um, uh, yes, uh, welcome everybody. It's good to see you all uh, virtually. And um, we did feel it was important since our last meeting uh, to share updates on how each agency's uh, responding to COVID-19 for our community and how we're managing it as an organization. And so um, we're each going to do a brief presentation and we'll take questions and comments afterwards. Um, so our presentation is, no, well, that's for the next agenda item. Here we go. Um, so we've been since, um, oh, sorry, since, uh, the 2019-20 school year ended, we've been working on our reopening plan for 2021. Um, we spent May getting community input. We work, with, we work with the district advisory committee that has stakeholder leaders from our uh, parents, students, uh, uh, groups, our unions, uh, the city participates, um, and other community leaders. And then we've done a few progress reports um, we just had a, a board meeting where we reviewed our draft plan. Uh, we'll have another progress report to the community on July 31st. And we have some town hall meetings coming up next week. Um, so what we've decided is we're taking a phased approach to reopening. The first phase is uh, distance learning and the second phase is hybrid and um, a hybrid of in-person and online learning. And so we're starting in phase one with distance learning uh, both because of the local health, health conditions and just recently, the state came out with guidance about when, uh, what criteria uh, um, counties need to meet for schools in the county to open. Um, and then also, we know to open for in-person learning, it's gonna take a lot of preparation to make sure we're ready. And so we need some additional time for that. Our phase one um, has a variety of components um, that you see here. I'll, I'll go through um, each one and so our jumpstart to success is recognizing, you know, when we left school campuses in March, students were already with teachers, teachers knew the families. Now we're in a totally different situation where students will be entering new classes, meeting new teachers and teachers meeting their students for the first time. So we wanna make sure we're starting the year prioritizing relationship building and creating a positive classroom environment even though we don't have a physical classroom. And so, our year round schools already started uh, uh, two weeks ago. And you can see this is East Avenue. They had a, um, their uh, pickup event 
uh, where kids got to pick up materials, meet the staff, uh, wave hi. They came with their families. Um, uh, obviously, driving through, we don't have our elementary students drive through uh, themselves. And uh, and so, you know, although a challenging start to the school year, it was really nice to welcome the the students and. Uh, then also our teachers are doing orientations with the families and one-on-one -on -one check ins um, And then what's changed since this, the spring when we went out, when we were really new to distance learning, um, we heard a lot of feedback from the community about needing to have a structured daily schedule. And so we have time um, where for each grade level, there is time where um, for synchronous instruction, which means that the teacher and students are live um, on a device over Zoom together, and then asynchronous time where students might be working independently, teachers might be working with small groups of students, um, you know, they're doing the assignments that they learned about during the synchronous time. And so uh, we have you know, um, that uh, mapped out for elementary school and we're working on that for secondary school as well. We wanna be clear, we are offering the full academic program to our students. So at the elementary level, we'll still have those prep classes where the kids get music and art and PE. Um, at the secondary level, we're offering all of our electives. Um, our teachers have been incredibly creative of how to do you know, music at home and choir, uh, choir and uh, art. Um, we're still offering English language development support for our students and our special education programs. And we're an educational institution, but we know we need to take care of the whole child to be successful. And um, as a community and as a country, we've gone through trauma and we need to be prepared to provide social emotional support to our staff and to our, and to our students and families. So uh, we're putting that in place. Um, we also, um, you know, working to get the technology in place. Um, we're buying additional Chromebooks for our students. We wanna make sure every single student has a Chromebook and a device to use. Um, we bought hotspots. Um, I want to thank the, the city for being a partner in, in that um, and in getting us resources. We also are upgrading our teacher laptops. The start of year round schools, we had given some devices that just didn't have the capacity to provide um, our teachers what they needed to be successful with distance learning. And so we're getting new laptops for them so they could do that. Um, and we're using a lot of online tools as well, um, uh, now having bought licenses for the whole district. Um, we're gonna be providing training um, for our staff. And um, you know, we do the training, we also record the trainings and so they're available um, at, uh, for staff to watch afterwards. Uh, working with our families, uh, we've been doing workshops since we went on closures and we'll continue with those. Um, you know, working to, again, you know, provide uh, food and health services and get them connected to that as well. Um, so while we're in distance learning, we, we are having, um, you know, staff who are sometimes coming to our campus. So putting in place those protocols and um, making sure we have all the equipment ready. Um, you know, and then just thinking, you know, since we don't know for how long we'll be on distance learning, how else can we meet the needs of our community? Like, uh, you know, we know there's a, a huge economic impact to this COVID crisis. Uh, so maybe we're looking at offering, we're continuing, we've been continuing to offer the breakfast and lunch, maybe offering dinner or weekend meals. Um, you know, how, how can we work with community partners to uh, help, you know, um, provide opportunities for kids during the school day? And we'll hear from some of our partners uh, today. And then when we do move to phase two, it will be a hybrid model. Um, a hybrid of in-person and distance learning. And um, there'll be, students will be on an alternating schedule so we don't have all the students at school at one time. And we'll also allow families to have a full distance learning option. And this is what's been the hardest thing for us. Um, you know, and, and is, uh, um, you know, in education, I mean, we're responsible for, for, to provide uh, the uh, education to our students. Um, but we're being asked to make decisions where some of the factors are beyond our control. And so that's been very challenging. So we don't just get to be the ones who determine our future. We need to wait for the state guidance um, uh, on how to proceed, as well as working with the, our county on when local conditions will allow for in-person learning. Uh, but then there are things we can control. And so we're really working to develop um, criteria, to meet um, criteria 
so that whenever we're ready to go back, we know on everything we've controlled, we can, uh, we have things in place, like having the necessary materials, um, providing the training, getting those procedures in place, meeting with our labor partners to make sure um, we've negotiated the impacts of their working conditions. Transportation, you know, having in place the process of what happens if a, um, a student or staff member does get COVID. And so we're working on that while we're waiting for the state. Um, uh, or the state has provided guidance now on when uh, schools can consider coming back. Before you can even consider it, you need to be off the state monitoring list for 14 consecutive days. Um, and you need a few other things in place, like having masks for everyone, um, te testing, uh, and things like that. And then the county, these are the indicators they look at that determines whether we end up on the watch list or not. So, you know, it's been hard because we, you know, just a few weeks ago, we thought we were going to be doing uh, indoor dining. Uh, here in the county, maybe in downtown Hayward, but because cases and hospital, hospitalizations have actually increased and we haven't had sufficient disease containment, this county pulled back on that. And, you know, that's what we've been talking with them. If, if we're telling our community you can't eat indoors, how can we tell our community we can start, you know, have kids go be at, at school and indoors for, you know, six hours a day? And so that's when the state in, uh, aligned um, school reopening with the indicators they're using for other sectors. Um, so um, lastly, while we, like I said, we're, we're, we are preparing um, our facilities for that return to school. This was in our year round office. You see, we have the shields um, up and our office staff has masks and trying to get everything in place for when we do come back. So um, I know there's a lot of information, this big summary, starting with distance learning, moving to hybrid when state and county conditions allow and HUSD conditions. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. I know that this is really a joint facilitation of this uh, agenda and presentation. So I, I thank you all for letting me just uh, come in and out of the dialogue here. But Dr. Wayne, if you wanted to go ahead and introduce uh, the next speaker on this item. Um, um, we yeah, sure, we can, we can go to the next speaker, uh, our next uh, agency then just take questions for all of us uh, afterwards. So yeah. um, I'm, I, I happen to see city manager McAdoo in my upper right. So go for it. Hi, everyone. Good to see everyone this evening. Um, I'll just do, I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'll just do a, a few quick updates um, about some of the efforts that the city has been working on. And I think that are of most interest to this group and potentially the community. Um, as you know, we're still continuing to operate our free uh, COVID-19 testing site. Um, as of tomorrow, uh, that site will no longer be located at Cal State East Bay, and we'll be, we're doing kind of a two-part uh, switch of locations. So the testing site will be moving to the SkyWest Golf Course parking lot. Um, for those who don't know, I think uh, many of you know, but HARD has um, decided not to continue operations at the golf course um, when the lease expires comes up for renewal this fall. Um, so we will be taking advantage of that parking lot um, and repurposing it for the testing site and that will open on Monday. And then um, those of you who do know, we had our uh, partnership with the Alameda County Food Bank um, to do a food distribution site at the uh, SkyWest Golf Course. That will be moving to the Chabot College campus and we'll be continuing that on Thursdays, the, the food distribution site on Thursday midday. Um, just some other facts about the, the testing site. It will still be free uh, to individuals who don't have medical insurance or, or any other form of documentation. We will be um, now asking for medical insurance. So if you, there'll be an iPad, um, when you come up to the testing site, you'll fill out some information, including if you have medical insurance. We're doing this uh, because we now have entered into an MOU with the county where they will be covering the cost of the tests. Um, we will still be administering the site, um, but the county has now agreed to cover the cost of the tests, which is great news for us as the city was fronting um, the money for most of those tests for the last uh, several months. Um, but we do in fact need to bill insurance. And so now we've created uh, this platform. You'll also be able now to do online appointment scheduling. So we used to only do appointments for first responders, public, other public agency employees, um, but now general public members will be able to schedule appointments as well. And that'll be through an online portal that will be available on the city's website. And then also through um, 
La Familia, who is uh, now taking over the supervision of the nursing students and other uh, staff that are providing the testing at the site. Um, as I mentioned, the food distribution site will be relocating to Chabot College. Um, we don't have, I, I don't have the location of the parking lot that it will be in, but that will be announced. Uh, and all of this information is also on the city's Facebook, Instagram, Twitter pages, um, on the city's website. We have a COVID-19 webpage that has all of these updates. Um, some other great things that our library, public library is doing, um, we are continuing lunch at the library. Um, that is weekdays uh, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m. Um, at the downtown library. Um, anyone who would like to can come and pick, it's for youth um, up through 12th grade, um, can come and pick up a free meal at the library along with um, an activity packet. Um, so that is available at the libraries. And then we are doing what's called the HPL to go, which is the Hayward Public Library to go. Um, which is uh, allowing folks to uh, restart checkout of library books and materials. Um, so folks can call or um, order materials online. Um, the number to call is 510-881-7980. Um, and the pickup and drop off of material, well, drop off can happen anytime, but pickup is between 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Saturday. Um, we are looking at potentially doing something similar at Weeks Library, but it'll be some period of time um, given the, the facility changes that need to be made there to facilitate uh, the materials being um, sent out. And then lastly, you know, similar to the school district's reopening plan, um, we have very limited services that are being offered um, in person at City Hall right now. And it looks like we will plan to continue that for some period of time. Um, we are, we've told all of our employees to basically anticipate continuing to work from home if they can um, until after the holidays and potentially longer. And so we are uh, really trying to think about how we do some longer term repurposing of city services um, to facil better facilitate that. I think we've done a great job of um, kind of putting the band-aids on things to be able to, to make it make it through thinking, oh, it's just going to be another couple of weeks and we'll, we'll reopen. Um, and so now I think we're sort of looking a little more strategically longer term about really kind of pushing city services um, to the more remote um, distance kind of online um, practice. We will be, one of the big issues that we've been having is the payment of water bills. Um, a lot of folks still use cash uh, to pay water bills and try to come into City Hall. So we're actually, we've purchased two payment kiosks that will be in the lobby of City Hall so that folks can come in and um, drop off payments, either cash or with, with check or a credit card. So that will facilitate and help um, with some of that. We are continuing to process building permits and planning applications. Most of that is done uh, there's drop off and pick up boxes uh, in the lobby of City Hall, which has remained open. And so um, contractors and, and builders can come in and um, submit plans there. They'll get picked up by a staff member, routed, and then um, reviewed, and then permits issued, and then can be picked up in those same boxes out front. So uh, trying to make do with uh, the best we can. And I think we've been able to continue most city services uh, pretty seamlessly um, for the most part. Um, we are, we've started back up on um, street sweeping and, and trash litter pickup and cleanup and some of the maintenance services elements. And we will be starting to reissue citations for street sweeping um, beginning on August 3rd. We've been giving warning notices for the past month um, because the trash collecting in the streets has started to just really be a problem. Um, so we are gonna ask that people try and move their vehicles on those couple days a month when street sweeping occurs. Um, and we will be starting to issue citations again um, beginning of August. So I think that's all in terms of our updates for now. And then Matt, do you want me to, I think Megan Tiernan from Hard is probably, I think she's giving, are you giving the update Megan this time? I believe that uh, Megan's having uh, technical audio difficulties. difficulties. Okay, well, and I was, and Thank you, Kelly. Uh, good evening, uh, council members and directors. Board members, it's it's a pleasure to be here tonight. We, uh, yes, we decided that I would talk. Most of our action has been um, around recreation and parks and some public safety. So I was gonna update you on what's going on at Hard. I think the most tragic part of this was um, giving back almost $2 million in building rentals, picnic rentals, programs and classes and summer camps um, right out of the gate. 
uh, listening to people who couldn't have graduation events at our community centers, couldn't have family reunions and parks has been um, really indicative of the lifestyle change we're all experiencing and, and grappling with. Um, we had to do some really quick changes to our out of school time programs, <clears throat> but we were able to offer almost 70 camps uh, over a nine week period. Uh, they were three week sessions with 12 camper cohorts per the county directive. Um, we were also able to bring back about 25 of our 400 laid off hourly employees, no, no programs, no, no employees to put those on. Um, and we've also been able to bring back six or seven staff at the Mission Hills Golf Course and Driving Range, which are operating on a slightly less hours, but seven days a week operation. And, and they've been doing very, very well. A lot of people out golfing, but the parameters are different. Single golfers walking, no carts because of the equipment changes. So uh, I, I believe Dr. Wayne, you really stated it well. This is just the most incredible, ever-changing, uh, you know, directions and, and directives. And, and we continue to adapt. And I think I'm very proud of uh, my staff and, and proud to be part of the leadership team that's helped hard kind of navigate this. Um, playgrounds, picnic areas, barbecues, basketball courts are all still restricted. And uh, posting restrooms, tennis courts, skate parks, and dog parks are open, which is nice. It was nice to get the dog parks open for Father's Day. And we ran a campaign to uh, uh, take your dad to the park for the dogs to, to the dog park. Um, so we've been kind of working through that. We're operating uh, with minimal staff at the district office. Our uh, finance and admin and Janelle Cameron's staff have been doing incredible coming in to take care of making sure the bills, HR, payroll, all those things occur. Um, our park staff and superintendent, we after about the initial six weeks, we uh, released the park staff back into the parks when they could do outdoor work and gardening was allowed, I think, on the second order. So we've had our staff back in the parks. They're catching up. Um, horrible time. Fire season, everything growing and sprouting from spring. So we had some real, and see Kelly on her head, we've had some real challenges keeping up with the property and, uh, you know, moving the goats around fast enough to graze off all the, all the grass and things. So, but that's going very well. Uh, fields across the district. Um, our our um, formal sports center, Oliver E. R., uh, Oliver e. Alden and some other locations uh, are still kind of fenced and closed, but um, you know, athletic fields across our 100 parks are, are still open and available to people uh, to be able to go with their family and theoretically in their social bubble, although I know social bubbles are now being uh, scrutinized. So um, from a parks monitoring, uh, we have data basically for every single day from our ranger visits uh, across the parks, counting the number of people, counting the social distancing enforcements, um, and just trying to kindly educate people about wearing a mask and being social distance. Um, our public safety unit also in admin and finance has done a, a really good job helping us figure out the site specific safety plans and all the protocols. If you come to our district office, you ring a bell and we come screen you before you come in. Uh, for if you do have a need for customer service, but most of our stuff is being done like other people online and through uh, through phone. Um, we're in the process of requesting child care waiver right now. I'm not sure if you're aware, but in recreation, we generally don't license our child cares. There are some licensed uh, daycare facilities, but as long as we run programs, uh, day long programs for a duration of less than 14 weeks, which would be summer camps, and we're allowed to operate after school and pre-K programs for up to 16 hours a week. So right now we're looking to try to get a waiver so that we can get some of our buildings open uh, for parents that might need to work to be able to have their children come down and do distance learning. So um, it's really for us, it's a question of do you need care? You, you can't leave a seven year old alone at home to do their, their distance learning. So our ability to maybe put together some learning pods um, for to facilitate for people, socially distance our community centers, uh, ramp up our Wi-Fi, and run uh, distance learning programs uh, that might be distance learning in the morning and then after school type recreation in the afternoon until a parent can come back and get the child. So we're, we're scrambling for that. We're uh, applying for waivers for, I think, six centers across in all, in all areas so that if people are really pinched, we can help them get um, uh, uh, what we what we consider is very affordable daycare. I think it's going to be six dollars an, an hour or something like that to to just try to cover the cost for the staff and the 
and the building costs and things like that. Um, we, because we have no hourlies, we're, we're definitely scrutinizing how we bring people back and, and how we take care of them with no programming revenue on the recreation side of the house. Um, that kind of leads into what we're planning to do for the fall. We currently have about 70 classes and programs ready to tee up for the fall. Summer was difficult, camps, uh, care for workers, children, and uh, just kind of trying to get our arms around how parks could be safely operated and who could come and go and how we would monitor that was, was kind of on our plate. But um, we're looking at uh, reopening our pre-K programs, as I said earlier, uh, in September. Uh, we'll go from basically being able to sign up for a two-week session and, and a few days to month-long sessions to try and get those um, cohorts of, of youth together again that would be in constant contact, so shelter in place, come to pre-K, go back home, kind of like the distance learning centers, we'd like to operate on shelter in place, come down to your learning, go back home, similar to what we've been doing with our summer camps, and we've had pretty good luck with our summer camps, and, um, you know, we've had a few uh, testing and kids out and back in, but we haven't had any negative experiences so far with these 12 kid, two liter, uh, 18, 20 camps across the, across the district that have been operating this summer. Um, we plan on doing all kinds of, we plan on offering outdoor fitness, working with some of our uh, local businesses that are hurting to try and help them get outdoor programs in the park, yoga studios, uh, uh, fitness centers, um, to try to get them out uh, virtual dance, virtual music, or maybe virtual sports skills. Uh, yeah, we, we talked about you sign up, get a ball, we bring the ball to you, and then you go online and you can see what the drills and skills to practice with your ball for different sports. Um, drop off ceramics, drop off painting in a box, drop off arts and crafts and projects, and then you can get this project, go online and follow along as we teach you how to, how to build a, a birdhouse or how to um, paint a painting. I think of Bob Ross, right? The beautiful oil painting and going on. So we're, we're really trying to get outside the box on things that we can put back in people's houses. We continue to serve uh, senior meals at the Hayward Senior Center. That'll be moving to the Kenneth Aiken Senior Center. So I guess everybody's moving food services next week. Uh, starting next week, we'll have senior lunch. Uh, we've had curbside pickup for months now. We've served, I think, about 1,200 lunches to date now. Um, to seniors, and we've also been doing senior calls and visits. We're doing the same thing with our Sorensdale for our development of disabled adults, check-in calls, and we're putting together a whole plan to bring them back in with the Regional Center of the East Bay for virtual and distance learning. So we're feeling pretty good about getting back into the community and trying to really help and help mostly with, uh, you know, how do I distance learn when I have to go to work? Who watches my kid? Um, so that's the biggest one. We'll get our information out. We hope to get it out on August 21st for programs that will start after Labor Day and run a full series of, of fall programs. Um, I think the only, there's two only other things to really report are we took uh, the cooling centers from the county and we have made sure that all six of our assigned cooling buildings have uh, COVID ready boxes in place. So if we do need cooling centers and people do show up, all the signs go up, all the protocols get followed, all the disinfectants are there, masks, gloves for people who might need them are all ready. So we'll be able to handle the cooling center rush should this heat wave ever come that we're waiting for. It's pretty gloomy every morning. Um, I think finally, uh, I think uh, Council Member Lamnin, I, your timing of your email was incredible because we have been talking about uh, drive-in movies in uh, late August and, and September at some of our larger parks and parking lots, or we may be calling on uh, the city or the school district for, I think you had suggested, hey, we're unified parking lots. Uh, we're, we're working right now. This week we learned that you can, buy the, the, you can buy the system that allows people to tune their radio to the station the movie's on. So we're, we're flying along on that and we, and we hope to take the movie nights and try to bring you know, a sense of normalcy. Our whole goal right now is to just try, oh, and the community garden continues to thrive. That's awesome if you haven't been down there. But our, our whole goal is to just try to keep things in place for people for normalcy and, and try to help with the social isolation and, and you know, people who already feel marginalized and underserved feeling even more marginalized and underserved. So we're really trying to figure out how we can do a cast a broad net um, in a semi-fiscally responsible manner, but we also understand that, you know, community service is what we do. So I think that's about it. Um, thank you for your time.
All right, so um, thank you. We had the staff uh, presentations. Now usually time for the um, members of HLAC for questions and comments. Hi there, Mayor Holiday. We see you go right ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay, two, one for um, the school district, Matt. Um, could you explain about the food? You said you are now offering breakfast and lunch and might consider dinner and weekends. And how is that being distributed? Do people come pick it up? Yeah, so since we've closed, we've always offered breakfast and lunch and we're probably at the hundreds of thousands of meals served. But we offered it at one time from 11 to 12. We have 10 of our schools throughout the um, city and the district where we distribute, <clears throat> excuse me, and then um, and we give lunch and breakfast at the same time. Um, but the, just for the kids, just for it, your students. Yeah, it's just for the kids. Although we did loosen up um, the regulations for, you know, technically we were supposed to have kids in the car present with the family member who was picking up the food. But, you know, we wanted to make sure we got it out. And so uh, um, we've done that. And then we're, we're considering um and, you know doing the uh, dinner and weekend meals also and pick up and then yeah. thank you and then for um uh hard um if you is the theater i mean i realize you probably don't even know when you might even be able to how is your program is it going to survive so we have utilized the theater that's a very good question thank you uh, we've utilized the theater for uh some summer camp minor drama type programs for the 12 kids we can put in there the enclosed space we really don't see doing much in the theater until we can put people in the seats in a socially responsible manner right so it's it's very tricky we're planning we're looking at what our first show of the spring would look like hoping that everything we hear about a, a vaccine or you know this thing's getting under control maybe in december and january but as you know morality the the rehearsal, the rehearsal, the rehearsal brings people together. Theater is a very in-person thing, and this is just not an in-person situation. But I know that you are a patron of our arts, and I will keep you informed. And, and you know, we're doing what we can down there. We plan on using the theater site and the stage and the lighting for some of our virtual programming, webcasting, Facebook Live things, things where we can take advantage of the technical expertise down there to put something on the ground that that looks pretty professional. You know, the Nature Center is dying to do virtual classroom visits because that's one of our most popular things. Great, thank you. Other, I see um, Council Member Marquez has her hand up, go ahead. And then Director Hatcher. Hi everyone, good to see you. I hope everyone's staying healthy and safe. Um, thank you for the amazing work. I'm very impressed to hear all the updates and that. We haven't let up. Everyone's learning to just pivot, pivot, pivot. So thank you everyone for your great work. I do have a couple of follow-up questions. Um, Dr. Wayne, once we move into phase two and you mentioned, um, I think I heard you say there currently are not protocols in place, but by the time we get to phase two, should a student, a teacher or staff test positive, there will be measures to address that. So where will that guidance be coming from? I, I know it's kind of early, but just can you give us a sense of what we should be considering? Yeah, and we do have some protocols right now. So because we did have um, some, uh, you know, a staff member and a, a um, I think a family member of student test positive while we were on the um, uh, on our first um, shutdown, and we immediately work with the count, inform the county, and then they work with the um, person to determine the, uh, um, you know, kind of who might have possibly been exposed and then who they need to talk to and who, and then that gives us guidance of like, do we need to shut down the, you know, a class, uh, the school or the camp, you know, or the whole school. And so that's happened when we were already shut down. So like really it just ended up resulting in saying, we're not gonna have visitors come to school for, you know, two weeks. So what we're, where we do need to still develop is when is like I said when we're back what's going to be the determinant of if it's a whole class that would need to um you know go home or uh, the whole school and that will uh, that we're still waiting uh, i mean we'll be working closely with the county on that and our school nurses have been working with them and they've been great during this this time as well of of helping us 
know how to you know, make sure everyone's safe. Okay, thank you. And then you mentioned getting a Chromebook to every student that needs it and purchasing hotspots. I know that was a huge discussion point in our last meeting, hard to believe. This is our second going, go around doing this virtually. Um, so should there still be a need? Who should the parent contact if, if they don't have access to Wi-Fi or technology? So, um, definitely the school. And what we're also trying to do, uh, or will be doing now that Again, we're on an extended distance learning is um, we're taking daily attendance. So before we just track participation and uh, but now you, we actually have to take attendance as one of the state requirements even on distance learning and we have attendance clerks um, and other other staff who follow up with families if students aren't aren't showing up and so the attendance will be on zoom so if kids aren't there we'll be calling them and their families to uh, find out why and see how we could help out. Okay, and thank you for um, mentioning the social support, emotional support that we all need right now. And then I'm gonna switch over, switch gears to hard. Very excited to hear support being given to parents who could be working from home, but obviously can't sit at the computer and simultaneously assist their child with their academics. Um, I think this is gonna create a huge demand. So I'm just curious if there's gonna be a lottery screening system, but uh, to, I, I could see every parent wanting to take advantage of this. So um, hope we can meet the need in our community. Yes, council member, that's a, that's a great point. And uh, we thought we thought we would get killed on the day camps, like so many people needing care. And I think people are still a little cautious and and wanting to keep their their you know loved ones sheltered in place. Okay. Uh, but we are we are exploring as much capacity as we can. Um, we have multiple, you know, we have 11 large community centers with multiple rooms. And, you know, if we start rolling down this road and demand gets higher and higher, we reach back into our hours and we, and we just bring people back and work on connectivity to, to really try and help, you know, and, and because we work with three school districts um, in our district, you know, we have Castro Valley and San Lorenzo also, it's a, it's a large issue, but we have some really large buildings and nobody can go on them right now. So if we can figure out how to establish, you know, learning, learning pods that are um, follow the orders of, you know, we, again, shelter in place, come to the rec center, do your schoolwork, go back home, hopefully, right, to try and get a grip on this. But uh, we are we are very aware of the, the debt and we didn't think there was going to be a way to do it. And I finally got a hold of the right people, the Hayward representative for the Department of Social Services. We're talking to the state. And so we plan on on moving this rapidly, and you know, if there's demand, we'll get creative and figure out how to use maybe another non-traditional building for something like that. Right. We have, we have buildings all over. Thank you. And then, city manager, um, I'm not sure if I heard you discuss the COVID hotline. That's still operating Monday through Friday. Is that correct? Actually, we've we've converted it, so it is no longer. It's actually no longer. We don't have the general hotline. It's simply for testing, um, okay. and because the call volume for other inquiries, it's basically just all testing inquiries. So it is now. Um, let me get the new number. Give me one second. But we have a. There's a new number, and it is not the original hotline because most cities departments are now answering their phones even if it's remotely so um that that's why we um yeah switched let me let me look and see if i can find it okay well we could come back thank you everybody mm -hmm. while you find that number we'll go to uh director hatcher great thank you dr wayne and i want to thank the staffs again for the presentation and you know i was really excited at the beginning of this year for the leadership that's in place in our community for the staffs that all three organizations have put together um, and with a crisis like this, it's, you know, I'm glad that you, you're the, you guys are you're the, the team that has been put together. I think we were ready for exciting things uh, beginning of this year in one direction, we've taken care of um, the, the needs in the other direction. So thank you uh, for the leadership. It's, it's, it's very important and it shows. Uh, first question for uh, Superintendent Wayne. I, I, I agree with Councilmember Marquez, the emotional support through this. Um, is is a different type of learning situation. I think it was very needed in our communities uh, in the first place, and I think it just been thrust to the forefront with uh, with that need. And as you see, we talk about the virus, we talk about parks, and and of course education. And so when you mention the exercise and the PE portion of it, what kind of how's that going to look? I mean, obviously the you know just a, just a sketch of what PE looks like when you know 
the bell rings and what, what, what's that going to look like for a virtual environment? And I'll see maybe by the end of the meeting, I could bring up some of the videos we've gotten of what it looks like. But I teach, uh, so our PE teachers put together actual um, physical education routines. And then uh, they do, we'll also have Zoom classes with the kids where they see the kids do the routines. So, um, you know, so we're expecting PE to still be done doing, being uh, synchronous, like I said, where they're live and then asynchronous. And, um, you know, and so the, you know, the exercises then obviously you don't have all the school equipment or track. So that's why we have some good videos of kids doing dancing um, as movement and other, other fun ways to move. Uh, but there are actual lesson plans that the PE teachers uh, provide, uh, follow and do with their students. Great, thank you. Oh, and then athletics, as of now, um, athletics is being shortened to two seasons um, and they're calling it a fall and a um, spring season, but it's actually really winter. The practices can start at uh, mid-December and then we're gonna have like a shortened season for sports in January and then another one in the spring. So we'll see how that all plays out. But, uh, you know, it is, you know, that, that's a big loss for a lot of students not having the uh, athletics. Yeah, it's something that we've seen. I, I've been and visited a lot of our parks during this time and they're full uh, to capacity and to see the kids running with their families. It's a very family oriented uh, piece right now. And we see uh, folks outside in our communities, we see people walking. So uh, I'd like to see that because to me, that is a huge piece of this emotional support is the, the exercise piece of it, uh, along with the learning. Uh, for city manager McAdoo, thanks for the, you know, the, the work that's done and, uh, and also with our Hayward Fire Department and, uh, and the first responders for the, the testing centers, you know, um, but as, and I, my question also to the city council and mayor, potentially the mayor, um, you know, testing is something that, you know, is, is grossly needed. Is there any way to, uh, that's been brainstormed to do more testing sites? Is there anything on the horizon to show, you know, that's been such the, the conversation piece that it's, it's grossly been under, um, you know, we haven't tested enough. And is, is the city taken anything in to do more testing? Well, um, we have increased, we're doing probably close to five. We, we started out at about 350 tests a day. We're now doing close to 500 and we usually max out by like 11 a.m. or noon. The volume of people coming through the testing site is pretty phenomenal. Um, I was on a call with the director of the health services agency for the county and um, I think it was one day last week, they actually hit 4,400 tests performed throughout the county. So they are, they've, they, their goal is to do 3,100 tests a day. Um, that is one of their indicators to help us continue to move towards reopening. So they're up at about 4,400 tests, so like somewhere between the 3,500 to 40, you know, 4,200 tests a day. And I know they're still continuing. Um, I know uh, Washington Hospital in Fremont has put in, um, a, they've been asked, they've asked cities and um, different hospitals and medical offices to submit proposals um, to the county for how they would open community testing sites or community testing facilities. So the county's going through the vetting process on that right now. Um, I know there's a clinic in Union City, I cannot remember the name of it off the top of my head, I really apologize, but I know that they're very close to getting the partnership uh, solid, uh, solidified with the county, so that it, that process is in the works. Um, we are trying to um, continue to move forward. We, we've a couple times said, "Well, we'll we can we just like shut down?" And you know, we we've had to really jump through some hoops um, because the county's like, "No, yours is like the only testing site that has consistently worked," um, and so they're like, "Please don't shut it down." And it's like, "Well, we've got to relieve our firefighters who were originally staffing the testing site. It's like we were in wildfire season, and we need them back on the line." And so we entered into this partnership with La Familia and Eden uh, Township Healthcare District to actually have uh, supervisors on site so that nursing students and other students could actually do the test, administer the tests. So that freed up our firefighters. Our fire department is still supervising the test site, and managing the day-to-day -day operations, but we don't have firefighters there doing the testing. Um, we are still doing mobile testing. Um, so that's another avenue. Um, we do have that available. We're doing skilled nursing facilities, homeless encampments um, throughout the county. Um, the county calls on our two-person 
and fire department mobile testing uh, unit to go out and do those. And uh, it's great. The council did approve uh, in the budget this year to continue that uh, mobile mobile health unit is what we're calling it in the fire department on a long term basis. You know, as you know, most of our fire services um, have morphed into healthcare. Um, so we think this will be a really great once the pandemic's done a really great way to do preventative um, health services and to help uh, relieve some burden on the 911 system for more minor medical calls that can be addressed in home. So we're excited for that to continue. Yeah, and then I did, I did find the phone number. Um, so it is 510-583-5333. And that is now purely, it's we've discontinued the other city hotline. And that is the number you can call and make an appointment for testing. You can call and get your results on that hotline number. Um, so it's 583-5333. Great. I remember um, uh, Lamnon has had her hand up. Thank you. Um, I will add my appreciation to everybody for the work and the creativity and um, just the holistic approach. Um, so thank you all. Um, as we look towards the fall, and I may have said this at last meeting, so so I apologize, but um, you know. I got a call recently about um, as we look to the fall and we have all these drive up uh, food programs, which are critically important. Um, having the volunteers standing out if it's raining is going to be problematic. And also the idea that people coming to food and waiting in line, especially as this crisis continues and perhaps the jobs don't come back, um, may not be the, the most um, effective way to do that. And so um, and I know I've talked to some of you about this, but the, you know, the paratransit system it was able to pivot their capacity to be able to deliver food um, to people throughout um, the Eden area. And so wondering if between the school buses, the lifelong medical, Meals on Wheels, paratransit, et cetera, can we leverage, and then volunteers for the people who don't qualify for any of those, um, as well as um, food stamps and other food service, you know, HUSD funding, city funding, et cetera. Can we pivot to an actual delivery service um, that allows people to, you know, that the food comes to people rather than people having to stand in line? I'm wondering what the thoughts are about that. So uh, <clears throat> I'll, I'll respond from the district perspective. I'm actually gonna ask Alan Gard, our assistant superintendent of business uh, to share. Cause I, I, I know, I love the idea of the delivery. I mean, and, and I just the idea of how can we better serve our families, but we have strict rules around um, food preparation and, and distribution to uh, students. Like even, you know, even, uh, I mean, besides needing to take the COVID precautions, we're not supposed to like actually hand food. It needs to be in the bag. It's placed in the trunk. So I'll let Alan share from the, the um, district perspective, and maybe share a little bit more, Alan, what dinners and weekend meals might, might look like. Uh, and then we can hear from uh, maybe city manager McAdoo if there's city possibilities. Absolutely. Um, there's definitely um, uh, strategies that we're looking into to uh, better increase um, participation. And um, one thing to note is for our food service program, it's one of the only programs that doesn't have any guaranteed funding. And so it's strictly based on uh, meal participation. So uh, we've been thinking through ways we can uh, do that. Um, we're uh, developing a survey that we can reach out to communities uh, and um, call families, letting them know that these um, opportunities are available, uh, letting them know that you know in these circumstances, um, you know their finances may have changed, and so they may uh, now be eligible for the free and reduced lunch program, and letting them know about um, uh, that. Um, also, letting them know about um just the different opportunities so um one thing we are at least uh discussing is you know can we make a um like a, a you know call and a drop off like can we um increase the number of sites that are available uh when um our schools um when when we start school um in uh, august uh we would still have um all of the schools available for the um, pickups, uh, which would be from 11 to 12, uh, Monday through Friday. And um, on Fridays is when we would include uh, weekend meals so that uh, that would be available for them over the weekend. Thanks. 
Um, city manager. Yeah, just quickly, um, I think one of the biggest hurdles is um, we don't know where our folks are coming from. We don't ask for any documentation when they come to the site um, right now. Um, we're also serving uh, somewhere between 400 and 480 cars each Thursday morning. Um, and we've struggled to get volunteers even to just staff the distribution site, which takes probably about 10 to 12 volunteers every Thursday morning. So I'm just thinking logistically about how do we distribute to 480 households potentially with maybe 10 volunteers and it just the logistics of that um, are very challenging. And I think the biggest thing is we've got a lot of employees and some of the volunteers have now gone back to work. So we've really struggled every week to, to get people out to the site. Um, and so I think that's the biggest challenge. It's not that it couldn't be done. One of the things we have seen is that um, families are now um, partnering up. So like uh, they'll send one person and you they'll pick up four or five boxes for families in their apartment complex or their neighborhood. Um, we did initially look at having scattered sites throughout the community and trying to work with some of our partners to have different sites. But from just like the pure uh, staffing and logistics perspective, it just didn't work very well. So we'll continue to look at it, but I, I don't know that it's... Um, it's really feasible at this point from the, the city staff perspective to do delivery for that broader group of folks that are showing up for food. So I appreciate that. And what I'll continue to offer is that it, I think there's capacity here that we haven't touched. You know, the, the no contact delivery is happening. I mean, the, the paratransit is serving, last I heard was something like 700. So each week. And so, um, you know, what I think we're all doing the very best we can <laughs> with what we've got. And what I would urge us to do is come together. I mean, maybe it's an HLAC meeting, maybe it's a different venue um, and, you know, bringing in our transit providers, et cetera, and really pushing on the, okay, this doesn't work because those are valid reasons, but what if we weren't relying on volunteers, we were relying on available transit capacity. What if, we were um, looking at some, you know, smaller hub delivery, no contact, whereas, you know, every door to door might not be available, but um, partnering with agencies that may need to be doing some home visits in this, or, you know, door to door visits, wellness checks, et cetera. I just, I think that there's capacity here and I urge us to continue to, to revisit it, um, especially as we get closer and closer to winter. So um, not, again, I'm not sure what the right venue is, but I think, I think it's a little more possible than it feels like right now. I totally get why it doesn't feel possible. Um, I'll just challenge us a little bit more. Yeah, and we'll, we'll keep looking at options. I mean, we're, I definitely hear the inclement weather issue. Um, you know, I, we'll just, we'll keep exploring it. I just know we're, we're really struggling just to keep the distribution site open from a staffing perspective. So, um, you know, I think, I'm just trying to not put to, and then with the move to oh, yeah. Chabot, trying not to overburden them with too many other things right now, so. Absolutely, and that's that's where, you know, leveraging what's available is kind of what I'm trying to get us at as opposed to, you know, pushing on the same volunteers or the same staff of thinking that through and looking at what is working um, and seeing if it can be scaled. Um, I think there's a report either recently released or coming out soon um, from DSAL about how their model as working, so happy to share that when it's available. It isn't, um, I, I, again, I appreciate the pushing. I'll say we <clears throat> we had a hard time getting some volunteers to help um, early on the lockdown. And we wanted more presence when to support our food services people when passing out food, just because there was the scare, the concern about being out, out, out outside, right? And now, but now it's gone up and down. So, you know, a month ago, I would have said, oh, we could get people no problem. You know, now I'm like, yeah, yeah everybody, we're, we pulled back. Uh, but with the start of the new school year, there may be on our end also more opportunities for volunteers. So, you know, we can uh, definitely continue this conversation with the city um, about this. So with that, I'm gonna, um, get, how about we get to the, the, uh, um, to the, uh, Facilities report. I see Jackie Diaz has her hand up if she wants to share something briefly. Oh, I, yeah, I just wanted to add that, um, you know, I, this is such a great partnership and, and these agencies work together is so great. Um, 
you know, if there ends up being the need for volunteers, perhaps, um, you know, if there's one sort of call to action that, that all of the agencies can share through all of our different sources, and maybe there's one place to, to drive people to, um, you know, sometimes it's a matter of just publicizing the need for volunteers, and we all tend to go back to the same groups that we're, we are familiar with. But I, I would bet you a hot lunch that there'd be, if there was broad call to action throughout our combined communities, the schools, the city, hard, um, we, we know we could, it might be a great way of coordinating people and saying, hey, do you want to volunteer during this time? Here are some options for you, but call this one number or, or, or whatever it is, just to help coordinate that. But uh, you know, anytime that we can share each other's social media or um, publicity, I think really helps secure the partnerships between us. Great. Um, all right. So thank you. And yeah, well, you know, this, this is not going away. So our next HLAC meeting is in October and I imagine it'll be a topic uh, for the agenda then. Um, so in spite of the fact that we are, you know, still in a shelter in place and much activity has been reduced, um, we did want to provide an update from each organ organization on the work we've been doing around facilities because that a lot of that work has continued. Um, so again, we'll just have each agency do an update. I guess since uh, I'm talking, I'll I'll kick it off again. Um, and so you know we've done a lot of work. We we um, as I think I've shared in this forum before. We adopted our first strategic plan in 15 years last year. And one of the key components was operational sustainability. And our, our vision for success was, was that we will adopt and begin implementation of an equitable facilities plan that guarantees basic safety upgrades to every campus site and standards for technology. Um, I think we saw, you know, while we'd love to have, you know, every site be rebuilt from the bottom up, like we did at Tyrell or, um, you know, did at Martin Luther King, uh, that, you know, we don't have the resources for that, but we need to have every site be safe and one in which our students can take pride. So I'm going to ask Assistant Superintendent Alan Gard uh, to share about the projects that have been going on lately. Thank you, Superintendent Wayne. And so um, uh, with it, we, um, you know, none of this could be possible without the support from our community. And so uh, with the passage of uh, Measure L in 2014, uh, we've been able to uh, complete several projects down at the bottom right uh, with the amazing athletic fields at each of our three comprehensive high schools, and a, be a beautiful uh, new Cherryland campus for our elementary school, um, and uh, tennis courts for uh, Mount Eden. Uh, what's in progress right now is a new uh, harder elementary site um, and we're near completion of the STEAM buildings at our three element, uh, three comprehensive high schools. Um, what's in design right now are the um, three kind of headlining projects for Measure H that was passed in 2018 uh, with the modernization of Lauren Eden and Winton, and then the District Performing Arts Center. Uh, what's also um, still in progress uh, for design is uh, what we're calling a classroom refresh. Uh, so the focus is uh, once we're able to um, kind of shore up the building shell, uh, then we can uh, make improvements inside of the classroom because we don't want to make improvements and then a, you know get messed up because the roof's leaking and you know things like that. And so uh, there's a lot of projects going on uh, this summer. Uh, 37 projects uh, will occur this year, uh, in addition to uh, many kind of uh, large-scale maintenance projects. So. Um, uh, different projects that are occurring are uh, safety and security. Uh, so there's uh, kind of new, there's new fencing, there's been uh, working with our school sites on uh, what some of their challenges have been to um, uh, kind of uh, ensure that we uh, can make things secure. Uh, there's uh, several sites that have needed uh, brand new uh, roofs and so those are occurring as well. Uh, many of our sites have uh, outdated fire alarm uh, systems. And so they're getting replacements as well. Um, one thing is just, just doing a um, fresh coat of paint on the exterior, you know, helps kind of brighten the feel for, for the schools. And so there's uh, many exterior painting projects occurring as well as uh, pavement projects at our sites so that 
uh, we're able to move things forward. And so with the uh, progress at um, uh, the three steam buildings, uh, these are uh, pictures uh, recently of the three steam buildings. Uh, we have uh, furniture uh, scheduled to go inside uh, in a couple weeks and um, they'll, uh, Mount Eden and Tennyson will be ready shortly. Uh, there's um, Hayward High has a little bit of a delay, but um, that will still be online for the uh, 2021 school year. Uh, this is uh, three pictures of our Harder Elementary School building. Uh, they're um, you know, making a lot, uh, very much great progress. And uh, this is something that um, will be ready for the 21-22 school year. Uh, this is a grid of kind of all of the infrastructure projects uh, that are occurring over the next three years uh, with our school sites. Um, and so the first block for 2020 is the 37 projects that are occurring now. And so once we're able to accomplish that, uh, then we're able to move forward with, um, uh, with the classroom refresh over the next year and uh, the remaining projects. And so these are just some pictures of the infrastructure projects where uh, you know, new pavement in the parking lot and in the playground just really brightens up the feel of the campus, as well as, you know, Bret Hart Elementary, uh, Bret Hart uh, Middle School having a fresh coat there to really brighten up um, uh, the campus as well. Uh, we also have uh, solar that's on, um, that's uh, near completion, uh, and many of those uh, campus, many of those projects are already online. Um, and so uh, one thing that was also just, you know, um, uh, we wanted to ensure occurred was um, the picture on the left is a, a picture of uh, where the uh, a water fountain used to be at Hayward High, and that's been like that for uh, a for a number of years. And um, it's you know honestly a little depressing because it's hard to provide access to water. And so uh, what occurred this year was we we're able to provide. Uh, multiple bottle filling stations at each of our schools, uh, as well as providing uh, refillable uh, bottles uh, for our students so that uh, they're able to get the connection of sustainability, uh, as well as uh, ensure just um, you know, quick access to fresh water. Um, another thing I want to just point out is our collaboration with HARD and DESAL. And so uh, with a lot of um, great uh, support, we're able to um, work on uh, adding futsal courts uh, in the Cherryland area. And so uh, this is going to be an amazing project. Uh, so it's going to be uh, next to our uh, uh, Brinkman's Continuation School, uh, which is formerly the, um, uh, you know, which is the Hayward Adult School campus. Um, and then to the right is the uh, new Cherryland campus. And so uh, in the center of it is where the futsal courts will be. And so uh, we'll be able to uh, work with them and you know, create a lot of uh, uh, access for the community. And so uh, what are some things that we did uh, during COVID to really um, get some of the projects? Uh -huh. Okay, and then just, just in the interest of time, I'm gonna say, say uh, yeah, we, we took precautions during COVID to make sure we're, we're safe. And then just so you can see the, the Measure H projects, Lauren Eden, um, Winton, are, are, we're in the design phase. Performing Arts Center, we're very excited about. You can see this conceptual design, um, you know, and it's a 500 uh, seat uh, center. And we're, we're um, really thrilled that that's coming. And so, mm -hmm. uh, just uh, yeah, wanted to be mindful of time because we go till 5.30 and, and I'm gonna turn it over to the, so thank you, um, Alan. I'm gonna turn it over to Hard next because you might wanna, really the Hard is, is contributing the finances and the resources for the futsal project. Um, so turn it, turn, it, turn it over to Hard to share any facilities updates you have. Well, Matt, once again, we don't have a PowerPoint. <laughs> um, Megan is, is still just having technical difficulties, so I apologize. I was I was talking to her. Um, we 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 have so much going on in the district. Uh, we're working on acquisitions, you know, at uh, Mateo Street down in Up and Ashton Cherryland. We're working with RCD on the development of the affordable housing and future community center on Mission Up in Cherryland. Um, the Trust for Public Land 
and the Ashland Common site at 166 will uh, be starting to move forward, I believe in, in March. So that project is coming along and the trust with their, uh, they were successful if you, I don't know if you know, in getting about $7.2 million from Prop 68 from the state for that project. So that's a lot of good money for a one acre park. Um, Kennedy Park is coming along and actually on track to reopen in the fall. And we just had teacup training down there. So they're working on the, the new teacup ride. In addition to the train that will be going electric, we're going green with the train. Um, there'll be the teacup ride, the merry-go-round will still be there. Uh, fully revamped concession stand, more reservable picnic areas than ever before. A connection to the mansion and event areas, large parking. So we're, we're very, very excited about getting Kennedy Park back up and open. And then of course the long um, ongoing Cherryland Community Center project. Uh, we actually believe between the uh, a contractor going bankrupt and COVID happening and construction workers staying home, we actually have great hope that we would be um, as staff moving into that building sometime in late October, November and starting programming in, in the winter uh, when we hope we're allowed to have people back in our buildings. Um, there's, there's a bunch of master planning going on. We continue to work on the San Lorenzo Creek Trail master plan with an amazing collaborative people in that group and another amazing collaborative in our trails and um, our trails master plan with the Foothill Trail. And, and so we're, we're very excited. Uh, they have a ton of things going on and then there's lots of small projects. We, we put aside money for uh, what we call revenue enhancements going into the existing community centers, uh, cleaning up lobbies, rental rooms, doors, windows, floors, trying to make them more attractive for rentals and people wanted to be able to use them for rentals. So it's kind of like, let's fix the outside and then go fix the inside classroom. We're trying to do that with some of our community centers while we have a, a break from those. And I think the last piece is in the aquatic world, we're looking at ultraviolet um, sanitation systems that go beyond regular chlorine oxidation that would um, the, the UV light does a great job with viruses and bacteria and other things. So trying to get those in the pools to be ready and also um, variable frequency drives to save uh, money on motors and efficiency. San Lorenzo Park phase two is coming. San Lorenzo Community Center phase three is coming. Uh, we could go on all day with all the wonderful things we've been able to do with our uh, blessed bond dollars, but I think that's the, the quick overview for you yeah, because I see the time and want to be respectful of that. You're on thank, you. thank you, James. And before, yeah, before we move on to the city, uh, Jenna, uh, we also have Ken. He got sent to the attendees section again. So if you could move him back over, uh, Mr. Rowden. Uh, and then um, city manager McAdoo, a brief update. I will do, I will try to go briefly on some of our major updates. Hold on, let me see if I can share my screen. Can folks see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so just quickly, uh, we are finishing up Mission Boulevard phase two on the south end of the city from Industrial Boulevard. Um, it looks like we will be substantially complete with that project in August of 2020, um, so later uh, next month. And so I, if any of you have driven the south end of Hayward, it is looking fantastic um, with new protected bike lanes and a lot of um, really great amenities um, and improvements to the street. Um, we have completed, we're in the process of completing design for Mission Boulevard phase three, which is um, north on Mission Boulevard from A Street uh, to the northern city boundary. And so um, that when we complete this project, hopefully by spring of 2022, that will complete the improvement of the entire length of Mission Boulevard through the city of Hayward. Um, this is just a, a sample cross section of what the north end of Mission Boulevard would look like. Um, we do have a smaller amount of right of way, so really trying to figure out a creative way to create bike lanes. And so we worked with Bike East Bay to create what's called a cycle track concept where the sidewalk is uh, split and there's, you know, protected uh, bike path or cycle track, on, you know, uh, raised on the sidewalk. So it protects, protects pedestrians and, and um, 
uh, cars and bikes. So hopefully that will be a successful project and we'll be going out to bid uh, later this winter on that. Um, really great uh, news. We um, just went out, uh, got bids back on our fire station six and fire training center project, which is um, a part of our measure C uh, sales tax measure that was approved by voters a number of years ago. Um, we actually, the bids came in um, about, I think about $10 million, if I remember correctly, under the engineer, maybe five to $10 million under the engineer's estimate. Well, significantly under the engineer's estimate. So um, we believe now we've got the funding secured. Um, really grateful for our partnership with Chabot College. Um, they are contributing $20 million in their bond funds to help fund the training center development to um, uh, really support their fire science program and some of their nursing and um, pre-nursing programs. So it's going to be really great partnership. We anticipate construction starting in August. Um, we also just recently completed major renovations for all of our other fire stations, um, with ex the exception of fire station one. So um, this will, uh, this, the fire station six and training center is actually out at the airport um, off of Winton. Uh, if you drive down Winton uh, past the Toys R Us a little ways, you'll, you'll see it. So this is just a rendering of what the new fire station will look like. The training center will be behind it. Um, it's going to have some really cool, uh, we call them toys, but they're very expensive pieces of training equipment, um, including uh, BART has donated um, a BART car and an elevated track platform so that we can have have training on uh, BART facilities. And so we're really hoping that we can use this um, and, and basically uh, lease it out to other departments for training and, and hopefully generate some revenue back to the city. So excited to move forward on that project. Um, along with uh, uh, the Mission Boulevard phase two, the South End, we are working to develop the Mission Boulevard Linear Park and working on uh, working with HARD on that project and the future operation of it. So basically it would be a five acre park that runs the length of Mission Boulevard um, between Chapel of the Chimes to Fairway Avenue. And so we've started design on that and um, hopefully uh, we'll find some funding that we can put towards that and start construction uh, later this year to really improve that as a linear park feature in the south end of town. And there's some renderings of what that might look like going forward. Um, I'm going to skip the fiber optic network where we have a federal grant that we've been working on to build out fiber in the city. Uh, Little Vista Park, also a partnership uh, we've been working on with HARD, a uh, 50 acre regional park. Um, we are start estimated to start construction in fall of 2021. We are just finishing up the design on that. Um, here's a rendering. Um, this is the extension of Tennyson Road up and this is um, there's some new home construction up at the top end of the Tennyson Road extension. Uh, Mission Boulevard runs kind of along the bottom left hand of your screen. So really a, just a great uh, park with a lot of amenities. Um, uh, really cool if you, you can see the plans on the city's website, um, but we're really excited to have this um, almost 50 acre amenity of a regional, regional draw and really excited for that to, to be constructed in South Hayward. Ah, our library. Um, the library is substantially complete. We're still working on some punch list items. The plaza is making slow progress. Um, the contractor that we have had uh, working on the project has been involved in a number of litigation items and um, issues with other cities and communities that have been causing financial difficulty. So we have been, it, I, since I live right near there, it's, you know, one or two workers are out on the site every day and it's like a slow trickle of, of construction that's happening. So we hope the plaza will be done uh, this later this fall. Um, really right now it's kind of the finishing touches. They were actually outpouring the sidewalks and pathways uh, the other day. So uh, it's irrigation, landscaping, and then um, one of the major issues is the replacement of a PG&E transformer. And we have to wait for PG&E on that. So uh, not, not all the contractors delays, but uh, substantial part. Um, and then here's obviously the renderings of the plaza um, and really just will be a great amenity uh, for downtown once it is finally completed. And then um, we are uh, moving forward with our paving project this year. And um, one of the things that we are working on this year is actually building in community equity as a guiding principle and looking at um, sort of impacted neighborhoods and um, communities that may be disproportionately impacted by um, 
roadways that are in disrepair. And so really trying to put an equity lens on how we're doing paving. I think it's just a really interesting um, if you've ever heard anyone talk about equity lenses on paving, um, thinking about in, uh, I know it sounds very, it's actually quite cool. Uh, I just have to share this because I think it's actually a really good uh, thought process. But, um, you know, if you look at roads in say um, a lower income neighborhood, um, if someone in that neighborhood breaks an axle on their car versus someone in a higher income neighborhood, um, the, the potential negative um, sort of rolling effects of a broken axle on a lower income family's car might lead to them not being able to get to their job, job loss, homelessness, um, et cetera, et cetera, versus communities where there is, um, you know, higher wealth, it's a little easier for them to manage with the, uh, the sort of breaking of an axle. So not that we want anyone to break an axle on any city street, but in terms of really kind of applying that equity lens and really trying to look at how we're um, distributing street improvement funds throughout the city a little differently. Um, so if you can see, uh, we obviously have a lot of road repairs going on in the sort of Jackson Triangle, um, sort of Tennyson, South Hayward area this year um, in particular. So um, those, that's a little roadway map. And I'm not going to talk about Main Street, Complete Street. And that's it from our, just some of the major uh, projects. So <clears throat> we obviously had a lot to share with you all, but it's 520. Um, and we can take a few questions. The last agenda item is really just a, a brief update. So um, I see Elisa has her hand up. Hi, I will be very brief. Great work, excited to see all the progress throughout our community. My only request moving forward, please, please, please be mindful of color selection. Um, I don't remember who mentioned it, but color is very important to increase positive attitude, um, brightfulness. So let's just be very considerate um, on anything that we paint in our community. Thank you. And then um, <clears throat> um, I do see we have a, a few attendees. Uh, Ms. Rodriguez, we had any requests for public comments on this item or the previous one? No, we have not. Okay. Any other um, uh, HLAC member comments? Lisa, again. Is this announcements? Uh, no, that's the, uh, actually, that's the item after the next one. Sorry, I'll wait. Okay. So uh, moving on to the next item, we have um, just wanted to, this is kind of an announcement, but we are having our first um, in, in, in an apparently quite a while, a joint city council and bon, uh, board of education meeting. Uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. McAdoo to share a bit of the background on that and uh, what topics we'll be covering. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, Superintendent Wayne, um, we are gonna, this is a, a meeting that was, came about as the result of a city council referral from uh, Mayor Pro Tem Mark Salinas and council member Wahab, Aisha Wahab um, in October of 2019. Um, you know, obviously the city and the school district collaborate in a lot of different ways throughout the year, including through HLAC, but there was a desire um, by a couple of the council members to have a full city council and school board joint meeting um, to really talk about issues of mutual concern between the school district and the city. Um, we, it is scheduled now for Tuesday, August 4th, next Tuesday at 6.30 p.m. It will be on Zoom. Um, the agenda should go out later this afternoon. And um, we were originally scheduled to have the meeting back in April. And obviously it was actually on the calendar for the end of April and we had scheduled it and then COVID hit and uh, we basically postponed that indefinitely until we could figure out the lay of the land and you know how we were all navigating this. Um, and then obviously with um, the murder of George Floyd and the subsequent calls for police reform nationally and, and here in our local community, um, one of those calls is for the elimination of school resource officers or police officers on school campuses. And so obviously given the concern 
concern we've heard from our local community groups, um, the mayor and the school board president, the superintendent and I um, thought that the that would be the most appropriate topic for a joint meeting. Um, and so that will be the probably the main topic of discussion. We will also do as a, another topic on that agenda, uh, sort of a, a, a abbreviated COVID-19 response update as it relates to issues that overlap between the school district and the city. And so there's it is an official meeting of the two boards. It will not be in kind of the town hall format. There will be a, a formal agenda. It will be, you know, sort of the, the sort of typical uh, board or council meeting. Um, and no decisions are being made. It's simply a work, work session type format, um, information format for that meeting next Tuesday. So we just wanted to provide this group with an overview of, of what's happening on that front and um, happy to answer any questions. We'll be publishing the agenda uh, for that this um, this evening uh, as well, and then have all the materials that come come accompanying it, it attached by Monday. Yeah, there'll be uh, presentations that will be distributed. Yeah. All yes. right. Do you want to get the announcements, uh, Elisa? Yes, I just have um, one quick comment about the joint meeting. Thank you for coordinating it. I know it's been difficult scheduling just with everything going on. My only request, because it is a work session, if we could please communicate that clearly to the community. I don't know if there's time to add that to the agenda, define what a work session is. We have people paying attention now more than ever, and there seems to be a lot of confusion in terms of processes. So if we could please just be very upfront with that from the beginning and then have a clear um, outline in terms of what are the next steps, just so we can manage everyone's expectations. The please. mayor had a comment. That, that, is, that is all part of the agenda. There will Perfect. be opening comments that will cover those things by um, Dr. Walker and me and, um, and uh, Yes, and we will be outlining what the next steps on, you know, at least uh, probably the agenda item most people will be interested in, I think. That, so, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And then my brief announcement is, um, if you don't already know, we are um, doing a 2020 census caravan next Thursday, August 6th at 5 p.m. We're meeting at Glassbrook Elementary School. Um, I will email staff and ask them to share the flyer with everyone. We're also going to be distributing decorating kits. And if you haven't, you see all the beautiful census posters our students have made and they look amazing throughout our community. So please come out. This is going to be practicing social distance, wear your mask. We'll be distributing these amazing masks. So come out and get them and hope to see you there. I know um, Hard has an update to share. See, this was Megan's cue, but she's she's <laughs> off. So, uh, so, not to share the Hard update, but you have an executive director retirement and search. Is that, is that right? If uh, uh, Director Hodges or Ashley want to share? Um, yeah, I think I'll defer to uh, Board President Hodges on this matter because Megan, I think, is still not able to speak through the microphone. Yeah, uh, not a lot to the report out. It's we hate um, losing Paul, but it's um, it's for health reasons. So we're we're right now in the midst of, of um, a search for a new GM. So um, I, I guess I don't know if I'm ready to call it an exciting time. It, I, it's kind of a, a a hard time, I think right now yeah no I, I know we all appreciate um paul uh paul mccreary is the executive director of his work in the community is what like four or five years in the position uh, I it's think. about five years yeah. yeah and has done a lot i mean with the you know not just the passage of the bond which was a whole team effort but shepherding all the projects and really you know increased the collaboration among these three departments and so he, he will definitely be missed and he's retiring at the end of september is yeah yes but one thing Paul has left us is a, a superb staff. I, we've got an all-star lineup, so life will go on, but we'll miss Paul. Uh, any other announcements, people? I was just going to mention that on Saturday morning, there is a memorial service, a Zoom memorial service for 
former our former council member and former Alameda County Supervisor Gail Steele um, at um, it's 10 o'clock on Saturday morning on Zoom. And if you hadn't heard about it or needed the link, you could probably contact either me or Sarah. Who are, um, Sarah might be better to actually direct you to the <laughs> right link. Although I, I could do that too. So anyway, if you need that information, let us know. Ken, you need that info? Oh. Yeah, well, I do. But also, do you advise getting there early for that? I know that I tried and tried to get into the Mitzman uh, Memorial Service, and I, I was not able to get in. Yeah, there'll be a thousand participant limit on it. So hopefully it'll, people will be able to, so that's the only, the only caution is uh, there is a thousand person limit for participation. So okay. and that uh, hopefully will be enough. Go ahead, Sarah. Sorry. I was just going to, no, you're fine. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up. And I think um, the goal is to have the room open, you know, five fish, five, 10 minutes before 10 o'clock. So hopefully you won't have any problems. And if anybody does, feel free to text me or um, kind of doing the tech side of the thing. Our mayor is uh, moderating, so and we should be should, lovely. Yeah, hopefully we will watch for that to make sure that we don't start and if people are lined up to get in that we'll try to get them all in before we actually kick things off. I also had another question to Matt and, and Kelly both. For mm -hmm. the upcoming joint meeting together, what 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 are you doing for public comment in that? Is it just general public comment or is there public comment on each item individually? How's and how much time are you leaving? And what's the limit on speaking? So I think we're having um, public comment though there's two agenda items. One is the COVID update, one right. will be the Youth and Family Services Bureau slash school resource officer program discussion. Um, we've identified public comment for each of those items on the agenda, but not general public comment. So it'll just be agenda item specific um, and limited to two minutes per speaker for public comment. And 45 minutes max or what? We had not placed a limit on it because there, this was the only, these were the only two items on the agenda. Um, and typically the city has not limited public comment. I know we got some crit criticism at the town hall we had because there was a lot of people who didn't get an opportunity to speak because yeah. we did end the meeting. So uh, um, that's, that's, but if, if there's strong feelings one way or the other, the mayor and Dr. Walker and Matt and I can discuss again, so. Thank you. All right, I see Director Hatcher has his hand up and then Council Member Marquez. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Wayne. And I, I'm just gonna step out to the national level uh, today, just gonna wanna recognize uh, the passing of Representative House Representative John Lewis. And I was able to listen to a lot of the uh, the services today. And, um, you know, I know we're, we're, we're in a global situation here on one level, we're on a local situation, obviously with our own agencies, but um, I think we're ready for the task to uh, to bring this equity to where it should be. So I, I just I'm I'm invigorated on a national level uh, to bring it back to the local level uh, to do what we need to do. So I just wanted to make that comment in that respect. Thanks. All right. I don't, I'm not seeing any more comments. Um, Dr. Walker, did you want to close this out? Yes, I would. I am just feeling really good about being in the company of everyone that has been on this uh, in this joint meeting this afternoon, uh, serving with you and especially through this uh, challenging time of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic um, has really showed how we all collectively uh, are willing to uh, do our best to serve our communities uh, uh, collectively. So I appreciate what we've heard about equity this evening and the importance of that in serving our communities. And I just, uh, I just feel so humbled and honored to just be in your company tonight. And I thank each and every one of you for stepping up and sharing your voice and uh, really just caring about uh, others. Um, and so with that said, I would uh, like to respectfully uh, close this meeting in honor of our honorable Gail Steele. And uh, again, uh, look forward to meeting with you all in October. So in honor of Gail Steele, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.